Welcome to Debate Night, everybody. My name is Charlie Kirk. Debate is at the core of our constitutional republic. Shared ideas inspire collaboration and innovation. Debate makes way for empathy and wisdom, and it shapes our culture. America is a unique place where allowing the best ideas to win is both a means for progress and the essence of freedom. Threats to debate suffocate the air within churches and classrooms, spoil dinners amongst friends, and give unwarranted failing grades to college students and deprive American institutions of conversation. That is over, starting now on debate night. Here, all ideas are welcome and conversation is the point. We'll present two sides of an issue and let both points breathe. This isn't for the sake of winning an argument, but for exercising and thus preserving our right to free speech. America is not debatable, but ideas are. Tonight's debate tackles Fauci virus restrictions and mask mandates in schools, but the conversation can go anywhere. Tonight's special guest is host of the acclaimed show Indisputable on the Young Turks Network, as well as the Rashad Ritchie Morning Show, airing daily on News Talk 1380 WAOK. You may also know our guest from MSNBC, the Fox News Channel, Black News Channel, or BBC America, where he regularly stars as an analyst, providing insights on things that he calls social justice and cultural issues. He is the president of Rolling Out Magazine, which reaches over two million readers every single month, and his passion for building a better world for America's youth sparked the Rashad Ritchie Foundation, which helps improve the lives of children in at-risk communities. He's a lecturer, a professor, analyst, host, writer, and editor at large. Tonight's guest is a dynamic force, and I'm thrilled to have him here. And he's objectively a very nice person. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rashad Ritchie to debate. Hey everybody, welcome to Debate Night here at Turning Point USA Headquarters. Honored to have with us today Dr. Ritchie, a very well-known radio talk show host in Atlanta, also a college professor, amongst many other things I'm sure I'm forgetting. And today we're going to be talking about COVID mandates, schools, masks, and so much more. The way that this conversation will go is uh, Dr. Ritchie will begin with some thoughts uh, for two minutes uninterrupted. I'll respond with two minutes uninterrupted, and we'll go back and forth in that format for about a minute each. Then we'll take about a 10 second break or a little bit break, and uh, then we'll just kind of have at it. And so, Dr. Ritchie, thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. You about to be in trouble, Charlie. All right, here's the thing. Mask mandates in schools are 100% appropriate, and here's why. First of all, the vast majority of American voters actually support mask mandates for school teachers. Uh, and for those who are inside of the school system. Uh, but let's look at what it actually does. A mask mandate, people that argue against it, they say this is an intrusion on civil liberties. But think about it. A dress code, is that an intrusion on civil liberty? A vaccination mandate, is that an intrusion on civil liberty? Let me bring you back to K through 12 education again. 100% of all public schools in the United States of America require vaccination to enter. That's your vaccine passport already in play. 92% of private institutions require a vaccine in order to attend. Let's go to the mask mandate. The mask mandate protocol is in place for the safety of students. This is based on verifiable science. 90% of those in the field of science, the field of study, they say that yes, it actually decreases the spread of COVID-19. But now you have people around this country, literally rather than throwing on the mask, they rather throw fist. They're fighting school teachers. They're fighting those that oppose them and they are threatening to fight school board members because of a mask mandate. I have not seen this kind of activity at school board meetings over anything except for these mandates. But remember, mandates are already in place. School boards have the statutory authority to implement administrative law given to them by the states based on the construct of the 10th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. These school boards were well within their constitutional right and statutory authority in order to implement such a protocol. Just as they have the ability to say, here's the dress code, here's the vaccination requirement, here's the teacher credentialing requirement, and here's what it takes to pass to the next grade. Very good. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ritchie. So here's how to first respond. First of all, we have to ask ourselves the question, is the Chinese coronavirus or the Fauci virus a serious threat to children? That's the first question. 
And so Dr. Macquarie wrote a story, wrote a piece, I should say, for the Wall Street Journal, where he studied tens of thousands, it was over 40,000 children with the virus and was not able to find one child that died from the virus that did not have underlying health conditions and that did not have um, some sort of immunocompromised condition. And so you look even more broadly than that. And this is from the New York Times. I just want to read this, which is annual deaths among children in the United States. Now, this is per 100,000 people. So children 5 to 14 years old have a 2.1 per 100,000 chance of dying from cancer, a 1.9 per 100,000 chance of dying from vehicle accidents, 1.5 per 100,000 to die from suicide. We'll get back to that in a second, 0.7 from homicide, 0.6 from cardiovascular disease, 0.5 from drowning, 0.3 from flu, and 0.2 from COVID. Now that's not percentage, that's per 100,000. So the question is, if children are at a greater risk of riding in a car to school, then why all of a sudden should we now mandate the masks for children. So I think we're talking about two different things, and I think we'll have a fun time going back and forth at the unscripted part of this, is do schools have the ability and the authority, and is it a good idea? I'm going to start with whether it's a good idea, then we can get into the other one. It's an awful idea. It's bad for interaction. It's bad for childhood development. We already see the increase in mental health issues that I will go through some of the numbers associated with that, but everyone has kind of experienced that in their own way. And saying to a child, who is not at considerable risk of dying from a certain virus that you must change the way you interact, I think is child abuse. And the floor is yours. All right, you have one minute, Dr. Christian. All right, so let's talk about uh, the numbers. Yes. Okay. Uh, the Delta variant has changed the game in many ways. Where now you have children who not only have the virus, but they are experiencing adverse uh, reactions from the virus like, like never before. I take it to a place called Jackson County, Mississippi. There's a school superintendent. Uh, this guy decided to ignore all COVID-19 protocols. He says he's going to live a life that's external of the fear of the pandemic. Well, his school system, they have a 7% uh, COVID positive rating. They've already lost a school teacher. Here's the other dynamic that people aren't considering. You think children go to school in silos? These children who can be carriers of COVID-19 can infect their social uh, environment, such as their parents, their grandparents, other peer groups, people that their families associate with. And then it becomes an issue of the ecosystem of our safety, not just the silo of the school system. Very good. I, I will respond. So I'm glad you brought up the Delta variant. So a lot of people have done some, at least some initial studies of the Delta variant. So according to Dr. Roberta DeBassi of the Children's National Hospital, she was asked about Ari Shapiro from National Public Radio about the Delta variant. The National Public Radio host said, wait a second, if kids under 12 are not vaccinated, is, is the Delta variant a significant risk? And she said, quote, children are still somewhat between 12 to 15 percent of all COVID cases and still 3 to 4 percent of all hospitalizations. And we have not seen a huge change in that, even with the Delta variant. Now, I'll add to that where the Boston Globe, not exactly, you know, a politicized paper to the right, asked the question, is the variant more severe in children? Dr. Sharon Doran, epidemiologist at Tufts Medical Center says, no, I have not seen any peer reviewed data or data from a reliable source to suggest that. So I would submit doctor that there is no data to show the Delta variant has any harsher cause. In fact, the data shows the opposite. Let me respond, all right? Um, so here's what we know about the Delta variant. Uh, based on CDC directives, uh, the Delta variant is more adversely affecting young people than it has previous with the original design. Uh, to suggest otherwise is silly, and here's why. You can go to a place like Alabama. Alabama, for the first time, they have run out of ICU beds. The Alabama leadership, Governor and Beyond, they have blamed this on children going to hospitals that did not go before with the original COVID virus. They're now being hospitalized like never before, and they're running out of ICU beds, and at some point, this week or next week, they may run out of ICU beds. That's because of the hospitalization, not only of adults, but also of children. At last count, they had over 400 children hospitalized for COVID. They had a fraction of that during the first on onset of the virus. 
almost perfect timing. I got to give you credit for that. It's almost like you do radio or something. <laughs> so I'll respond to this in a couple different ways. And there's a lot more to unpack once we kind of go back and forth. First, we have to ask ourselves the question, are people being hospitalized because of COVID or with COVID? Now, this is something I've been saying for quite some time, but The Atlantic, which is a publication, I think we can both agree is not exactly on the right, came out with this at the end of their article. It was actually just published recently, where they asked the question, and this is the same doctor, Dr. Shara Doran, who's an epidemiologist at Tufts Medical Center from Boston, very reputable, right? So she disagrees with the CDC. She says Delta variant is not a significant risk for children, right? And we're going to talk about what can, what can, what, what do you do when you disagree when you have competing studies? Because I think that would be an interesting discussion where she said, quote, as we shift from cases to hospitalizations as a metric to drive policy and assess risk, we should refine the definition of hospitalization. Those patients who are there with rather than from COVID, don't belong in the metric. So I would just say, doctor, when you say 400 kids are hospitalized with COVID, we don't know that's necessarily true. In fact, some say that number might be even 50 times too large. You saw you? Okay. All right, here's the thing, Charlie, and I keep, I keep hearing people make this argument that somehow it matters that children who have an underlying health condition are the ones who are dying or being hospitalized. That doesn't matter, Charlie. The fact is that these are children, and some of these children aren't even aware if they have an underlying condition, and that's not 100% of the data. So when we continue to create this us and them narrative that somehow says, well, the only children who are dying are those that have an underlying health condition. Well, hell, you can have an underlying health condition that does not make you any less significant as it relates to a virus or the spread of a virus that's preventable. So are we having an argument about a civil liberty? Because if this is an argument about a civil liberty, then the COVID issue is a separate argument because you have no issue with your seatbelt mandate. You have no issue with your mandate to have a driver's license even though you can buy a car without it. You have no issue with these other mandates which are required for the safety of others, but you have an issue with this mandate which we've already established that statutorily school boards have the authority to implement these mandates and American citizens by and large are for the mandates in K through 12 education. So I'll get to the civil liberties in a second. As, as you notice, I didn't mention it all. I'm saying this is a bad idea, right? This is bad for children. And also it's, it's bad for teachers, bad for an educational environment. And so I'm gonna reiterate one thing. I'm not minimizing that it's children with underlying health conditions that are dying. But children with underlying health conditions have a predisposition from dying from any sort of infectious disease. And the vast majority of children in this country are healthy, which is why we frame it in that way. And so this kind of goes to this question, a couple different questions. And I would love to ask this question to you. Um, let's just focus on whether this is a good idea, then we could focus on whether the government has the ability. Do you think there are any downsides to children wearing masks in schools? Hell yeah, of course there are downsides to it. There are downsides to wearing a seatbelt. You know a percentage of people die every year for wearing a seatbelt, but the vast majority of them have their lives saved. So, so let me be clear on I'm this, glad Charlie. You, I'm so glad. Let me be clear on this. There will always be a cause and effect relationship with any social variable change implemented in our current structural society, no matter what. Mask create changes. It is a social deviation from the norm. But when you look at the risk of a child either having severe respiratory complications forever, potentially dying, or potentially infecting their parents or grandparents, we weigh that. We weigh the same variables as it relates to vaccines that are already mandated. Brother, in the school system, the vaccines that are already mandated are very clear. Mumps, um, Measles, polio, All rubella, MMM. Every yeah, I mean, single one so, of them. But, let me ask, but do you have an issue with those? It's a totally different type of vaccine, Why? first of all. First of all, those take 10 to 15 years on average 
to develop. Secondly, they've just changed the definition of a vaccine. So you have an issue with the vaccine, not the intrusion or Well, again, we'll get to the civil liberty part of it, right? So I'm not saying that a school does not have the ability to mandate certain things. Instead, my argument is that this is detrimental to children, their development, mental health issues, their Mm -hmm. ability to interact, and it doesn't even do what you say it's going to do. So let me just read something. That a study was done about masks that shows that if the mask is even adjusted by 3.2%, it totally invalidates any sort of efficacy of a mask. Who did so, that study, Charlie? Well, this was written by Daniel Horowitz. But and it was Stephen Petty, one of the most certif- ex- experienced certified industrial hygienists and exposure experts in the country, has a study that he did on this. So Stephen Petty, the audience can look at it and they can have their own sort of interpretation. Now, most of the mask studies that you're probably going to mention are done in laboratory style environments, not with six year old children. And you can agree, you've seen six-year-olds, they're moving the mask all the time, which totally negates any sort of potential benefit. So if kids aren't going to wear them properly and the cloth mask is basically a joke, then why why subject them to this kind of submissive kind of cloth face diaper? All right, so you're incorrect on the data. So let me go ahead and correct that data. Um, First off, uh, the data that you're citing is what we call an outlier data set. Okay. 92% of the field of actual research scientists agree that masks decrease the spread of COVID. As a matter of fact, the only deviation from that agreement is by how much. The lowest end is 10%, the highest is 91%. Can I ask a but, question about that? Oh, I get to, yeah. give me one second, brother. You got it. All right, so University of California, they have a study uh, and they uh, posted this just a few days ago and if anybody wants to read it, it's called Still Confused About Mask, okay? One of the lab studies that they highlighted showed in a high-speed camera scenario, respiratory droplets. This is how the virus travels with the viral load. Those respiratory droplets were found within 20 to 500 micrometers. That's your size. They were generated from saying a simple phrase. So just talking to somebody creates a viral load 20 to 500 micrometers, right? Having a cloth in front of your mouth decreased it by virtually 100%. Now, that flies in the face of individuals who say, well, cloth masks do nothing. And remember, cloth masks are also now recommended for public use by the CDC uh, and the uh, the, the, uh, World Health Organization. So when you say they do absolutely nothing, even the data that you cite that says it doesn't do as much is at 10 percent effectiveness the other data that's the majority of the data says it does it at 80 to 90 percent effectiveness so i just want to make sure i'm understanding your position your position is that first of all does that study factor in whether they wear the mask correctly or not whether that they're touching the mask all the time and they're moving it does that study factor for that this study factors for droplets that are so it transmitted. Okay. And but, that's fine. But, but think about it, Charlie. But, I mean, a seven-year-old is not going to not your, touch your their issue, face and move Brother, the mask. think about it. Your issue, the argument you're making with me, is an argument of education. That, that means that young people have to be more educated. I'm a former high school teacher. All right, there are high school students that may not wear the mask properly. There are grown folks that don't wear the mask proper, properly. Well, that's the part issue, of the argument. The issue then is education and proper wearing of the mask. You're literally making my no, argument that, for me. That's part of the argument. The other argument. You're making my argument saying if you wear it properly, then it does, in fact, decrease the spread of COVID. But they don't, and they won't, and you know that. You're dealing with eight, nine, and ten-year-olds. The other part of the argument, though, is that it actually makes us unfamiliar with one another, harder to communicate. It stunts childhood development. So I want to read some of these numbers, and I want to I want to ask you. Do you think that masking children forcibly is going to help the 90% increase in suicide that we saw through March from that 2019 to 20? Is it going to help the nearly doubling of mental health issues or the 333.9% increase in intentional self-harm claim lines? Is You're blaming all that on masks. No, no I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm asking you a question. Mm-hmm. Is that going to help or hurt America's mental health crisis. Let's be very clear, brother, because I want to understand exactly what you're asking. Are you saying that a kid wearing a mask and adjusting to a new social norm yields this result? No, I'm asking you. No, it doesn't yield that result. There's nothing in the data set that says. Okay, so you think that masks have no impact whatsoever, potentially mental health, 
Brother, I just answered that question and told you they do have an impact, but COVID-19 has even a stronger impact what makes you on say our that? social development. Because, because, because the, the risk of death, brother, is so low you, for children. Let, no, brother, no. Let me tell you where I come from. When we talk about children, Charlie, we're not talking about a silo of just kids in an educational system. We're talking about kids that are connected to a greater community. I come from a community where this COVID-19 virus, brother, has ravished the black community. And it's not just because children wear masks or don't wear masks. It's because of other variables such as uh, health care inequity, et cetera. But if you look at children and just say, well, the mask thing is the only thing. It's not just that. We don't want young kids going back to infecting parents and grandparents. And if it's such a bad idea, Charlie, are you disagreeing with over 60 percent of Americans who say who care about their children? Now, you can't say these folks don't care about their children. And they are saying in all of the survey data that we want mask mandates for our children so they can be safe. What do you say to those parents that say that? I have a difference of opinion. And by the way, thankfully, we have a system just because you have 60 percent of opinion doesn't mean it necessarily only becomes law. We'll get to kind of the I want to get to the civil well, rights thing law. in a second, but it's such a, or it becomes precedent or gets implemented or whatever it is. So as I mentioned, the New York Times said that COVID, you have a higher chance of dying from flu, flu and pneumonia, drowning, cardiovascular disease, suicide, homicide, vehicle accidents. So to be consistent for, per 100,000 for children, <laughs> right? Okay. Are you okay with banning driving? So let's go to this. I'm okay with making sure kids have a, uh, a, a set, of prerequisites in order to drive, which, How about by the a way, passenger? Th oh, wait a minute. By the way, that's already the law. Children do not get to drive just because they turn a certain age. They have to get a learner's permit, go through a training process in order to get that license. We are, and why do we do that, Charlie? We do that because we know that driving is dangerous. That's why we do that, right? Well, also being a passenger in a car as well. I'm, well, just, I'm just saying, brother, to be everything to be some level has a danger, right? If your view is to make safety a priority over liberty, then I'm just mm. asking you, because that is really the question, right? No. Do you have the liberty to be as God made you without a mask, right? That God is, made you without clothes. You got clothes on. Well, and we wear clothes for a reason. We know well, that we the don't have a biblical reason for that. It's the law. But, and you will be charged with indecent exposure. God also gave us a face for a reason. Be able to interact and empathize, to communicate. Come on, so man. I can see your expressions. Let me ask Charlie, you a question. Charlie, come on, Do you on, think Charlie. this debate would be better or worse if we had masks on? Uh, it'll be the same for me. Really? You think so? Let me tell you something, brother. That's interesting. I, okay. I teach college classes and lecture with a mask on. All of my students have masks. I go to law school, we all have masks on. My professor has a mask as well. And I've actually been in schools when schools first started back where masks were required. And let me tell you something about real teachers. School teachers are able to teach with a mask on and without a mask, it's called pedagogy. And some of the really good teachers, they're able to translate the message of the mask into their, uh, into their curriculum. But once again, you're avoiding something that's huge and right in our face. Is the benefit, and this is a question of what you believe, it's the benefit of protecting children by saying you do have to wear a mask, you do have to abide by a dress code, you do have to abide by a particular, particular behavioral standard. Are those directives inside of a school system to protect the overall and general safety of students? Is that a good idea? I say yes, you say no. Well, no, and I think you're coming from a false premise. The data I showed is that they're not at risk and considerably from the Delta Silo variant. Silo thinking, the, brother. The you're not thinking about their families the or The data I or showed else. showed that they don't even wear the masks. The data I also what percentage? showed also shows, well, the again, 2% of the- What percentage of kids do not wear the mask properly? I don't have data on that, but if you've ever been around a six-year-old, they don't wear anything properly. Man, they I, eat dirt. I, let me tell you something, man. <laughs> let I, alone wear a mask properly. Charlie, and I mean this in all due respect. I've been inside of school systems recently that did the let's come back thing and let's wear a mask and let's socially distance. Those kids were well behaved. They did not take the mask off. They adhered to it. Even if a 2% adjustment, doctor, 2%, well, it, it changes everything. Well, it changes it based on the research that I have from 90% effectiveness, and it can lower down to 10%. All right, you got a lot of wiggle room in between so, that. No scientist says that wearing a cloth mask is ineffective. 
They just argue on the effectiveness with the majority of the science and majority of the data saying it is well over 50% effective. That's not true. There's a study out of Denmark that shows there's almost that's just no one increase. study, brother. So see, that's a good question. I'm going right. to get to that in a second. What happens when you have different studies? What happens when the body of evidence yep. contradicts? Because that's an important question, I right? I think that's a great question. Because that, what, how do you govern oneself when you have, I have this study, I have that study, yep. but I just want to make sure that the people watching can see where I'm coming from my perspective. Yep. So let me just say kind of one other point on this where okay. you said that w am I willing to make adjustments for child safety? And you kind of asked, that was the open-ended question where I say it's not about that at all. In fact, the downside, in my opinion, far, far outweighs any sort of benefit, especially when Dr. Macri, who said, I stu he studied right here, he studied 43,000 children with COVID and was not able to find a single death. Now you say it's also a transmission issue. Dr. Macri also said that children, quote, are not significant carriers or super spreaders to adults. <laughs> okay, so, wow. So we're gonna have study collision, so go ahead. So let's, let's talk about study collision. Um, once again, outlier data. What that doctor just quoted to say that children are not carriers of COVID-19 is outlier data because over 90% of the field agrees based on research and study that kids are carriers of not only COVID, but of any virus. And you literally just made that argument with me. You literally just said, Charlie, that kids do not properly wear their mask and they're spreading things by not properly wearing their mask. You have made the that was not contrast my argument. argument. I said if your argument was true and masks worked, mm. it would only be true if every child was a perfect automaton mask wearing no, student, man. which do of course we know work? is not do true. Do seatbelt mandates work? Of course they do. Does everyone wear but one? Do you know what's amazing about a seatbelt? Charlie, does everyone wear a seatbelt? After belt? you're in a car accident, it doesn't give you natural immunity from getting in another car accident. Brother, That's does, what makes this totally does different. Does everyone wear a seatbelt, Charlie? Of course not. Do we then go back and unravel, because only 49 states have seatbelt laws, do we go back and unravel the 49 state uh, statutes because there are some people who will either A, not wear them, or B, actually die because of them? We don't do that, Charlie, well, because we see the benefit of wearing that safety belt, that protocol right. so, far outweighs anything else. So we haven't... I've not been convinced by And let's talk the, about the data. data. Let's because talk about I, the data. Because we're going we're gonna to collide on data. Okay. But let me ask you a question. When it comes to driving and safetyism, do you think we should bring speed limits down to 20 miles an hour, which would definitely save lives? Is that a good handoff? Yeah, so let me get back to that. It used to be 15 miles per hour, by the way. Is that okay with you? Because that would prioritize safety over liberty. Well, I think you always weigh it. But let me answer your first question. Okay. I'll get back to that one. You talked about conflict in data, right? Yeah, like what happens and, and, when and I have a study? I have a study. What do That's we do? That's right. So here's what happens. Science, a lot of people misinterpret what science is. They say science is a fact. Science is not a fact. Science is a field of study. Now there are some things that are scientific facts, like gravity, okay? But science is a field of study. And I do think sometimes scientists do themselves an injustice when they do not describe science as such. It is a field of study. Now, what does that field of study mean? It means you study the field. So what's the field of science? All of these research surveys, these research, um, these laboratory experiments, these real world research experiments, that's the field of study. And so for you and I, who are reading the, the data from these experts, mm -hmm. what we typically depend on is what is the majority sentiment? What is the consensus among the scientist community? And that is how we start to derive our conclusions based on the research that we're able to analyze independently as independent thinking individuals. Now, you can still believe an outlier study if you choose. It is contrary to the majority of the science that's available for review, but that is still within your uh, right as an American, right? So that is how you do it. You're gonna always have clashing opinions uh, and conclusions, but literally in research, there's no 50-50 here. There's not 50% of the scientists are saying this and 50% of the scientists are saying that. Literally, you're giving me uh, eight, seven percent of what scientists are saying compared to 92, 93% of what other scientists are saying. That's the argument that you're making with me, Charlie. And I'm always fascinated by the 7% because they're willing to buck the consensus and pursue things that they have found in the scientific method to be true. And so 
I guess this is an, an important question. Then we'll get into what do we do when we have these differences, because that we're going to keep on going in circles of study versus study. And I'm going to say, well, according to this doctor, for mm -hmm. example, as I'll say, Dr. Daron, Delta variant, not sev severe in children. And then I'll say Dr. DeBasi said the same thing, and Dr. Macri. And you'll say, well, the CDC said this. I guess I'll ask you Which a question. Which are a lot of doctors. Well, let me ask you a question. The CDC contradicted themselves on masks. They contradicted themselves on vaccines. They contradicted themselves on COVID being on surfaces. Remember, they said it could be there up to five days. We know that not to be true. They contradict themselves on almost everything. If they've been wrong on the science of 90% mm -hmm. of doctors, why should we trust them now? You know, that's really interesting because uh, you trust them, don't you? It depends on what issue. Exactly. That's my point. Yeah. So you trust them depending on what issue. That is called confirmation bias. So, Charlie, well, it depends you, on the issue. If they're talking about, yeah, Newton's second law, then, yeah, I'll trust they, them on they, that. They don't talk about that. The, the issue with the CDC is not about uh, you discrediting all the scientists. Now, I, I take it back to one variable you just named, um, the COVID, the survival time of the virus, right? Yeah, like, if, is COVID able to be on this table for five right. days? Right. Initially, there were uh, uh, scientists that came out and said, hell, it can be up there for 18 days. Well, in certain environments, it can, because that was based on a ship crew, uh, a, a cruise ship, where the virus was still there after the princess 15 cruise days. Ship. That's yeah. right, brother. It was there after 15 days. Everybody was evacuated. They cleaned that ship top to bottom, and they still found active virus on the ship. So they came out and said, hey, listen, we're still learning this thing. We are connecting it to the field of study, which is called science, and we want you to be warned that we have active virus cultures still on this ship, and no one infected has been here for over 15 days. They reported that, and then people ran with it and said, oh my goodness, this thing survives for all of these days, but that was in a particular environment, and that environment was conducive to the growth and, and the uh, preservation of that virus. That, that's context that's important. So you mentioned outliers. You know, those of us that are trying to answer the question, what do we do about this? I'm fascinated by outliers. Mm -hmm. Outliers in science sometimes end up being true. In fact, we've seen this. You know, we were told that it was a conspiracy theory, that it came from a lab. Well, that's kind of the prevailing wisdom now. It definitely didn't come from some bat in the Himalayas. It's looking more and more like it came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It also used to be an outlier to say that we revolve around the sun. The heliocentric theory of gravitational pull as you know, authored by Galileo, used to be an outlier in science. You know, Newton's first, second, and third law, the idea that an object at rest will stay at rest, the, uh, the idea that there's force equals mass times acceleration, these things had to be eventually investigated and proven. I'll give you another example. Mm -hmm. It used to be scientific consensus that eugenics was good and the sterilization of women would improve humanity. Now, those are some extreme examples, Very I extreme. understand. But the point is that sometimes these, the, what if these studies are right? Do you ever wonder... What if there's some truth here? Do you ever wonder what if the majority of scientists are telling the truth? Well, of course. I mean, I entertain it and I, dis <laughs> I, I dismiss it on issue by issue. I'll give you an example. Okay. Like a majority of scientists right now are saying that we have to entertain another round of lockdowns in certain mm -hmm. parts of the country or the world mm -hmm. to try to stop the virus. I think that's a big mistake. I mean, I'll listen to anything that they well, say. Well, you may think that's a big mistake, but you're, you're saying that based on a socioeconomic factor. Well, I also could say it scientifically. I could also say it epidemiologically, right? So I, let's look at Israel and Sweden, okay. right? Israel was held up as this like beautiful country, mass inoculation. They've now gone through their fourth lockdown. Mm -hmm. They're on their fourth booster shot. Sweden, that probably had the most mature and prudent response mm -hmm. to the virus, is wide open. And Sweden has now banned Israeli citizens from coming into Sweden. And so I don't need, you know, a Ph.D. in epidemiology to say, hey, whatever decisions they were making in Sweden seemed far more prudent than what they were doing in Israel. And I suppose this is the question, which is, you have this multitude of studies, many of, many of these, the consensus that was put forward. So let's go back in time. Dr. Ronnie Jackson last mm -hmm. year said, do not wear a mask. People stop wearing masks. And now we're mask crazy. That was a contradiction, <laughs> right? Remember they said that at first that children might be at risk. That was a conjecture. That was not necessarily a policy. We now know it to be different. Okay. The point is that we should always be entertaining the minority opinion in science, right? <laughs> All right, brother. So, and, and honestly, that minority opinion has ended up being true almost every time. No, sir. No, sir. Uh, the minority opinion uh, has said some pretty extreme things. 
Uh, you have a minority opinion of people who believe uh, that the earth is still flat. Well, I'm not uh, one of those people. Uh, I understand I, that. I, I do believe in a circular <laughs> earth that All can right, be proven but, in a but, variety of different but, ways. But remember, you have some people that are willing to die by that sentiment. They are so dogmatic about the earth, right? And that's a scientific factor. That's earth science. Just because the data or the proclamation is an outlier does not mean it's true. Well, but here, I, but, but, Charlie, but, but calling let, let, let Dr. Dorona a flat earther is a little extreme. That's like, not, come on, brother. She's let, an epidemiologist at Tufts Medical on, man. Center. You, you know good and damn well. But you're kind of conflating those two things is what I'm saying. I'm not brother, presenting from flat From the extreme evidence. examples you just gave? Very fair. Come That's on. That's fine. Okay. So let's go to some simple things we learned about infectious diseases. Like you, I've interviewed a lot of infectious disease doctors, right? Um, some of them have been all across the United States, and now they're right here, uh, all across the globe, and now they're right here in the United States trying to fight this thing. Do you and I agree that masks decrease the spread of COVID? Do we agree on that fundamental basic premise? It's questionable. I would only agree if it's a certain type of mask that is worn absolutely properly, that followed the exact laboratory guidelines, if and only then, I would say maybe, which almost no human being outside okay. of a controlled, sterilized laboratory environment is wearing a mask that way. How do you wear a mask properly? By not touching it, not adjusting it, according to, again, okay. Stephen Petty, one of the most ex certified experts in industrial hygienist. He says that even if 2% of the mask area is open, 80% of the particles under 2.5 microns will escape. Thank you for saying that. Okay. Now, what area is he talking about, Charlie? It could be the top or the bottom of the mask. Right. I'm not exactly your mouth sure. Or your nose. The terminology. So yeah. if your mouth or your nose is exposed, then it decreases the impact no, no, of what the it, mask That's not what he said. Okay, go ahead. But again, I, I'm well, not what gonna, did he say? I'm not Charlie. gonna I'm not gonna profess, you know, to but Charlie, be read it again, a lifelong, brother. you know, student of mask wearing. But brother, read yeah, it again. Okay, I'm gonna finish it though, okay. right? Two percent of the mask area open, eighty okay. percent of the particles under two point five microns will escape. Okay. And he says that masks will be 100% ineffective, he says. <laughs> he. In blocking any particles that small when the area, open area reaches 3.2%. Mm -hmm. And he also says that if it's even adjusted by 4%, a small adjustment, it could end it all. And also, you know mm -hmm. this, you could, you could contaminate yourself. Not to mention Dr. Macri says that if you wear the masks, you could actually be reinfecting yourself and it lowers oxygen levels. So there are some things to you say know, that that's masks... really <laughs> that's really interesting. OK, and I'm so, citing so other me, people again. You, right. I got gotcha. you. And then, and, then and we'll that, go into what is, we do about it. Right. I think that's that, interesting. That is a minority report. So so let me take you back to what he's referencing. OK, he's referencing having the mask not covering your pie hole. All right. That's what he's referencing. The way it spreads through droplets primarily is through your mouth and through your nose. Once again, I cite the study highlighted by the University of California that found in a high speed camera, 20 to 500 micrometers were generated from a simple phrase, hello, goodbye, good to see you, okay? Mm -hmm. That simple phrase had thousands inside of those droplets, that's your viral load. A cloth mask, not one that is required for medical N95 personnel. N95 or whatever. Right. right, not that one. Just as a matter of fact, in the study, brother, they used a cloth towel, so, a wash towel, so, in order to show that any covering is, in fact, effective. So now this is the most important question, right? Okay. So half the country's on your couch, half the country's on my couch. It might be less than that. According okay. to you, it's 60%, right? So then the question is, how do we govern ourselves, right, if we have differences of opinions on yep. things that are constantly changing and confusing? Wouldn't the right answer be allow a parent and the child to make that decision outside of what a school district might want to do against their will? Wouldn't, shouldn't we always resort towards parental rights in situations hmm. like this? Let me ask you this, Charlie. Um, let's say we use the same standard for dress codes and school systems. That is not about what the policy is. It's about what the parent and the child wants to do. Would that be okay with you? Well, first of all, I think that a, man, a, a, a certain level of a dress code, I think, is just actually really good for childhood development. I would argue, I'm, I'm actually very pro-dress code. I would love to have kids wear shirts and ties. So I think 
there could be an objective argument made that they'll pay more attention. Okay. And but you can't make that argument for masks. You Let even said there's why. a downside. I don't think that if you, all of a sudden you said, "Hey, the nicer you dress, no, the worse man, there, the environment," there is a, it's the opposite. There, there is a psychological downside. Various studies prove it. To dress like you? No, man. See, if to I dress, if, if kids dress <laughs> like you, you can't dress like me, brother. I know, but if kids dress like you, <laughs> everyone would be smarter. So right? let, let me say this, Charlie. There are studies, uh, and and listen, man, I, I have a doctorate in education. There are studies that show education is not just for academic achievement. It's also for social development. And there comes a time, especially in a teenager's life, where they would like to express themselves socially through their attire. I'm actually more liberal as it relates to attire, right? I don't like dress codes as they are. See, but I'm, I understand. I'm more conservative. I kind of, I, I I kind of like it. I understand. I understand the decency As I structure, wear a T-shirt. Right? You know, you but, the, but the issue is we can't create a standard that says we're willing to put your life in danger or your child in danger by because you have a personal um, issue with the school policy. And remember, once again, the vast majority of Americans are for the mask mandate policy. So let, let's just go to this. First of all, okay. I think it's somewhat of a red herring argument because some parents don't like to send their kids to private school because they have a dress code. So there's some choice there. Yeah. I guess what I'm saying, though, is that you support a school board coming into the school and saying every child must wear the mask. Why not make it optional? Because here's what happens, is that some parents are going to yield to my opinion. Okay. Some parents will yield to your opinion. Isn't the right decision just to let parents choose? I think the right decision is to allow the elected representatives who were elected by those parents to enact administrative law to make common sense policies to protect the children and for them to listen to the science as it's collected uh, locally. I don't believe it's the right idea to do what DeSantis has did in Florida, which is to make a mask mandate ban, which by the way, 70% of Republicans disagree with his ban on mask mandates and defunding school systems who are in, op who are in opposition to his executive action. And a judge recently ruled in that Iowa. Governor DeSantis, yeah. that, that DeSantis in Florida was without legal authority when he used an executive order to limit a governmental entity that exists by statute. If you want to start making executive orders to restrict other gov governmental uh, agencies, go through statutory processes so, through your legislature. So let me ask you a question. First of all, I love what DeSantis did, and I love the idea but it's of illegal. coming in. Well, there was a judge that is rehearing. I think he actually just won on that. But you, I will yield to this, that there was an Iowa decision mm -hmm. that just said where a judge said what happened in Iowa was unconstitutional. So there, there are a lot of rulings there. I, I, I will give you that, that it's an open-ended question. But what DeSantis is doing is actually the anti of mandates. He's telling every student in Florida, you have, as a taxpayer, a moral right to be able to choose. And you want to talk about local government. You're mm -hmm. talking about local government, right? Mm -hmm. You know what the ultimate local government is? A parent and child. There's nothing more local Well, thank than you that. for saying that because, once again, the vast majority of them are for that, mask mandates. Th then let them mask their kid and let the other yeah, parents see, not mask their kids, what, right? Once again, once again, just because their child has a mask, right, it doesn't mean the child next to them will have one. And what is COVID? What are the masks for? The mask is for the decrease, primarily for the decrease of COVID, I, I, the decrease of the spread. I want to read some stats, man, because we've been all over the place. Most Americans are for the, re, the uh, vaccine requirement. This is a Gallup poll that came out very recently. So you want to do vaccines? That's fine. Okay. Happy to go into that. All right. Let, let's go to vaccines quickly. 54% of Americans support vaccine requirements in workplace settings. 53% report uh, that they're for them even if you're dining out. They want you to have a vaccine um, uh, passport. 61% of Americans would like to have that for air travel. We don't have that yet. You can still travel without a, a some, vaccine Some card, restaurants are starting right? to do but it. But I'm talking yeah. about travel. For sure. travel, we don't have that. Canada is implementing that in the fall. Yes. Other countries are going to do the same. If you're telling me that the school system, just think about this, and, and I'm going back to vaccines. If you're telling me that the school system has the legal authority to mandate various vaccinations, that's a needle going into the body of a child. They have the authority to mandate that but they do not have the authority to mandate a mask that is intellectually dishonest. Either the school board has the authority to mandate vaccines and masks, or it is all so governmental now, are, intrusion. Are you talking about measles, mumps, and rubella? Or are you talking right. and about- And some children have adverse effects of those uh, yeah, vaccines. I would brother. actually be more on parental rights to that, but I, I'm not gonna, the courts have ruled differently. My personal right would be that children should be able to go to school without 
the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. That's my own personal are opinion. You, are you against vaccine mandates as a principle? I, I, it depends on what you're talking about with that, right? right are so, you talking about the current one that's being called a vaccine with a changing definition of a vaccine, So right? you have an issue with COVID? Well, COVID do, I have a, do I have an issue with the one that was put on the marketplace without the usual 10 to 15 years of study and the peer-reviewed studies and the explosion right, so of various so Charlie, rec- responses? 10 to 15 years later, you will agree with me. Well, we'll That's see. That's what you're saying? I don't know. The, 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 the issue here is prudence, right? Okay. Is how are we going to use practical judgment to see what's in front of us and ask ourselves the question, should we use force to mm-hmm. all of a sudden say to a family, you know what? Doesn't matter about all these studies that may very well might be a small percentage of doctors, but you know what's so great about science? Mm-hmm. It's not an up or down vote. We don't vote on Newton's third law. Okay. So if there's not 100% consensus, it is an open question. And you have to keep on going through it in the but scientific follow, method. Follow the data. Well, the data can send you in different directions. As we've shown, we're, not gonna, we're asking ourselves, what do we do? Okay. So my opinion is that when things are confusing, okay. unclear, mm-hmm. and you have contradiction, yield to rights. Let people choose. Don't use force. <laughs> All right, man. That's a funny argument to me. Let me tell you why. Uh, there's a lot of disagreement about voting. Okay, you got state legislatures. They have passed laws saying you need to do A, B and C in order to vote. You can't vote by way of absentee without having this prerequisite. It's all over the place. There is no federal uniform to voting. Right. Then well, there, Texas, are, there is some. There is the Civil Rights Act. That's not true. Yeah, but which the, is the very civil, specific. The, the, the Voting Rights Act, I think, is what you're referring to. The Voting Rights Act was gutted by the Supreme Court a few years ago, who set it aside and said the United States Congress needs to now handle this statutorily, which is the reason why southern states like Georgia, Mississippi and others do not have to seek preclearance from the Department of Justice in order to change the electorate rules in their state before the Supreme Court set aside the Voting Rights Act, they would have to get preclearance from the DOJ in order to change voting rules in their state. So before we get to voting, can you complete the point, though, because you were trying to connect voting with COVID. Texas, they passed a a law. They passed this legislative standard that said constitutional carry. You're familiar with that? Big, big fan of it. All right. I'm glad you're a big fan of constitutional carry, right? Because it says you do not need a prerequisite in order to get a gun. No license, no government bureaucracy, no ID, no permit, no nothing. Constitutional carry. Because bearing arms is what? A constitutional right. Yes. Correct? Boom. I'm good with that. 100%. Is voting a right? Depends on if you're a felon or not. But it is a right. Because if you're a felon, you can't have a gun either. Yeah, that's that's, that's the question, right? So an extreme libertarian would say that we shouldn't, we should allow felons to vote, we should allow people to vote. Voting is a right, absolutely, but it's also, it becomes not a right when it's not secure. You agree with that. You don't want to all of a sudden question your elections. So let me now pose this to you constitutionally. You have the right to bear arms. Yes. That right can be limited. You have to age into that right based on the state law. Yes. Okay. You also can have that right taken away from you based on your criminal activity. Felon, as we agree okay. on. Right. Yep. But you do agree it's a right. Yes, but all, I mean, like, look, rights are conditional under the current agreement we've made with our government, where the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, there are exceptions. I think there's far too many exceptions. But, but I Charlie, yield to rights most of the time. Okay, let's yield to rights on this. And th- this is the point I'm making to you. If you're a big fan of constitutional carry, yes. meaning no ID, no permit, no well, bureaucracy. Well, I think that's an oversimplification of the Texas law. No, the Texas law says you don't need nothing. As a matter well, of fact. You just said felons can't buy the guns then. How do they know if they're a felon? Exactly, brother. <laughs> no, but, no, but the, exactly. That's my point. They, Constitutional I, 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 carry. I think you're misunderstanding. Charlie, the, I've researched this up and down. The Texas law. Constitutional carry does not require a prerequisite. You can just get a gun, carry it, and no law enforcement agent agent can ask you for a permit. Nobody. You can walk around with your gat I, I, I and under, nobody I understand can the point you. you're making. You All say, right. if you want to have laissez-faire policy on guns, then why don't you want to have laissez-faire policy on voting? Is that the question you're he, making? Here's the point I'm making. I don't know how that relates right. to COVID. I'm, but. I'm about to help you, brother. If you believe in constitutional carry, yes. why don't you believe in constitutional voting? Well, I do, that, which okay. means voter ID and so, security. But no people. ID for guns? You, you, you know what, you know <laughs> no the, permit uh, for you know guns? The big no problem ID with, for guns? The problem no with voting? ID for voting? Let me tell you why. Voting is how we build mm. our government. 
I felt you don't, guns let, let is let me how finish. you defend your government. It's true. That's also true, which is why we should have widespread gun, gun ownership and we should be able to protect ourselves mm. against a usurpatious government. Let me let me build okay. this out. All right. And if, I'll finish my point. I'm, I'm going to make I, the connection. I, I don't know how it gets to COVID, but You'll it's, see. it's interesting. Okay. okay. But voting is how we express our values and put people in positions of power. Mm -hmm. And if there's any question in the efficacy, the integrity, the transparency and how those elections are done, okay. the entire system falls apart, which is why I believe in transparent and fair elections. And this idea okay. that Georgia somehow has oppressive voter laws, they have 18 days of early voting, way more than Delaware has. They allow Sunday voting, which is souls to the polls, which is, I'm sure something you're very well aware with. So that's a misinterpretation of that. So I do believe in constitutional voting, which is leave it to the states. Let the states do what they want to do with voting. And that goes with gun laws as well as voter laws. All right. So let me make the connection. OK, uh, constitutional carry in Texas. No ID, no permit. Uh, Again, I think you're oversimplifying that law. No, there's not, also, let, let me tell you why. There are federal laws like the Brady Bill in 1986 that says okay. that felons cannot buy weapons, that the, the federal agents are able to get subpoenas Sir, against weapons. You're oversimplifying no, it. No, I'm not. I'm not I, oversimplifying the Texas law. The Texas law says we're not going to check a damn thing if you're walking around this state with a gun. Right, That's which, the Texas which I, law. Which I have no problem with. That's okay, a separate you thing have of acquiring no with the that. weapon. Right? Now, you have but, no problem. Well, remember. Uh, you can purchase a gun from a private dealer without showing an ID. They don't have to require that. So you that. call that the gun show loophole that's been largely misrepresented. But no, let's it's pretend not, you're right. No, no, finish no, the argument because we have, we have to take a 10 second break in just a second. But all right, finish so, your so argument. Let, let me yeah. make this quick. Yeah. Constitutional carry, uh, all good. Voting is a right. Constitutional voting. Ah, wait a minute. Y'all need no, IDs now. I, but, I, I'm big into constitutional voting. OK. All right. Now, here's the final point. Everything we're talking about as far as regulatory agencies, mandates for vaccines or mask or protocols for yes. COVID-19 is derived from the Constitution. There are two dynamics that the Constitution allows. No, I never said it was unconstitutional. It well, might wait, be. I said it's wrong. Wait a minute. But if That's you believe. That's two different things. Listen, There's brother, plenty of things that are constitutional listen, that are wrong. Charlie. Not everything that is Charlie, constitutional Listen to is my right. point, brother. If you believe in the Constitution, why do you dismiss Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3? or the 10th Amendment of the Constitution, which gives states and gives regulatory agencies and gives school boards these particular powers. These powers are expressions. I, I, I don't. I but ju they're expressions of the Constitution. No, 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 but I say they're wrong to do it, not that they don't have a right to do it. Okay. That's two totally different so, things. So you're making a moral argument I have against, been the whole time. I against have, kids I, wearing a mask to school. Yes, not only that, I'm making a moral argument of imposing oneself into a parent's decision to either have their child wear a mask or not. That's been my argument the but, whole time. But a parent's I have not decision. made a constitutional argument. You know why I haven't okay. made a constitutional argument? It's because the courts are open on this discussion. I would but the Constitution is not. Well, well the con again, it depends on states' constitution, it depends on precedent, courts' decisions. You know the law of and, reciprocation. But hold on a second. State cannot override. Courts the change US their minds all the time. We had Dred Scott, praise God, we reversed that. We had the forced sterilization of women in the 1920s, praise God, we reversed that. We had Jim Crow, praise God, we reversed that. Right. But I that wasn't in the Constitution. I'm intentional. Well, the Constitution, some people said, Jim, oh, it's Jim Crow, Jim Crow was not in the Constitution. Well, but now, they used bias, the 10th Amendment bias to justify is, it, Well, they used the state's rights clause. Right, which is your argument right, right now. Right, which. You know, bizarre way. No, no, no. Yeah. They use a state's rights clause and perverted the statute. So we've always had those who mishandled statutory legislation. That's something commonplace. No, I'm making a moral argument. I had the I, I whole get time. And, and an argument about childhood development. I get it. But Charlie, you're literally disagreeing with the damn parents. The data shows no, that not. over 60 percent of the but parents what about the 40 percent? So you're, you are. Let me just make sure I'm clear. We have to take a 10 second break. Okay. You are OK with saying the 60% of parents can use force against 40% of they can, parents. They can use a mandate, yes. They can use a okay. mandate for vaccines. So, so they can is, use a mandate for dress codes. They is, can use a mandate for that. So let me ask you this question. Okay. If 60% of Americans wanted to take rights away from black Americans, is that okay? That's a dumbass argument. Why? And let me tell you why. Because that's because the argument that, they used to make for Jim Crow. Sir. Is a that, democratic that, and argument. And it was an evil argument back then. I agree. And, and let me be clear. We're talking about the safety of children and mask mandates inside of a local school system that the majority of taxpaying Americans actually agree with. So They're in the minority here. We have clarity. I don't believe just because a majority of people believe something they should Neither be able to punish I, the other on side. This, on this case, I'm with them. I want to give you this opportunity just to kind of make your closing argument and kind of summarize it all together. Man, let me say this, brother. I don't want to make a closing argument to argue well, with you. What, I, whatever, just I, like I, the, I, want, yeah. I want to say this to you. Uh, you are a brilliant mind. Thank you. What Likewise. you're doing here, thank you. What you're doing here 
is going to provide clarity. We don't have to agree. The push and pull of the republic or the democracy, whatever you want to call republic. it, all right, is based on open, free, yeah. transparent, and authentic dialogue. And even though I disagree with you about 90% of the time, you are authentic in what you believe. Thank and you. brother, I go to war for you any oh, day. Well, thank you. And this sort of discussion is exactly what makes America special and to be able to disagree and still figure out kind of what we're doing. So we're going to take it. If you guys want to watch the rest of this Charlie Kirk Show podcast, hit subscribe on the Turning Point USA feed. That's it for take. Go to the Charlie Kirk Show and we're going to be back with more.